A few years ago, I heard some devastating news. It was about the Cookie Monster, one of my favourite characters from Sesame Street, and how kids these days needed to be taught that cookies were a sometimes food. If you're not familiar with this, you can look it up on YouTube. It's a very depressing song. Through the magic of song, shall we say, Cookie Monster learns to cut down on his cookie binges and reach for fruit instead, which is an anytime food. I discovered two horrible truths that day that one should not take dietary advice from a puppet on television, and that most of my life until that point had been a lie. <laughs> Clearly I was not the only one that saw the Cookie Monster as a valid role model, as opposed to the reason for childhood obesity. I thought that using the Cookie Monster to push fruit onto children was some kind of joke. Now, I'm not a parent or a nutritionist, so relax. Uh, but after 10 years of hospitality as a cook and a waiter, Please take this advice with a grain of salt. Teach your children that the Cookie Monster is for entertainment purposes only. And I beg you to use more than just Sesame Street to educate them outside of school hours. I believe that we can explore the world through food, as long as we don't have any hang-ups about sometimes food and restrict ourselves with limits that we don't need to have. Sometimes food is a euphemism for bad or junk food. So, you know, pretty much everything that's your favourite food. It's like how they say that anything that's, that's good in life is either illegal or fattening. Placing food up on an on invisible moral scale gives it some kind of value to us to make it seem virtuous to control your intake of sometimes food to become a better person. So the better you can control your intake of sometimes food, you can lord that over somebody else. Now... As a qualified feeder of people other than myself and a lifelong consumer of food, I believe in all things in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> now, if you're a parent or if you have a really good memory, you may be familiar with a certain stage of human development where everything that's amazing and new and fascinating about the world can be experienced through the marvellous input device known as your mouth. Pick it up, shove it in. That's, that's all you do when you're a certain age. The trouble with being that young, lacking a developed palate, and having limited intelligence, shall we say, is that you're not particularly discerning about what you're shoving into your mouth. So that's where the whole parenting caper comes in. We teach our kids what good food is, such as all that stuff on the plate in front of you, including fruit and vegetables, and also telling them what bad food is, such as that random thing you found in the sandpit at kindy, don't put it in your mouth. Don't grab those bright and shiny things at the supermarket. That's, that's bad for you. So somewhere along the way, the lessons we learn from our parents and also from our peers form a moral basis and a collective wisdom for what we should put into our mouths and what we shouldn't. It starts very early on with stuff like, you know those mud pies you made in the backyard? They are not delicious or nutritious. And it ends a couple of decades later with, oh, I should be good today and order the chicken salad. I've got a dress to fit into next month. The number of influences increase to the point where we have so many voices around us, it's like we're trying to impress an invisible collective of peers with every single thing that we eat. Somehow, you know, years later down the track, the simple act of eating turns into a judgment of our character. Our value as a human suddenly comes from what we put in our plate. As we get older, we forget the original reason why we're attracted to eating food in the first place, which is a sense of curiosity and wonder, and also being hungry. As we get older, we, we develop preferences and dislikes, and some of us have to deal with less fun stuff like allergies and intolerances. And then you have the popularity of shows like MasterChef, which have exploded to the point where chefs have fetishized our obsession with food where it's acceptable to think and talk about food and cooking and food production, food sourcing all the time. But I think the true sign of mastery is getting someone to eat and enjoy something they don't think they want to. Parents who understand what I'm talking about here, I salute you. Some call this trickery or downright blackmail, but I call it a craft. I'm thankful to MasterChef and shows like it for increasing Australia's interest in cooking. But I'm wary of glorifying fancy techniques and obscure ingredients 
because people might think that the time and money invested in a dish is what gives the dish value, as opposed to the way that it tastes, or the simple satisfaction of feeding somebody that you love. When I was a kid, I didn't need much conning into eating, and my folks were pretty good cooks. They knew a hundred different ways to cook and disguise pork. You know on Iron Chef where they announce a secret ingredient? and the contestants have to duke it out and make as many dishes as possible that showcase that ingredient. When I was growing up, probably until I moved out at 17, it was like every week was an Iron Chef pork battle. I had no idea. Everything that we were fed was basically pork. <laughs> they made dumplings, wontons, filled buns, stir fries, curries, thank God we've had lunch. And I knew none the wiser. It wasn't until I moved out at 17 that I realised how limited my own abilities were and how clever they had been. When I was a kid, my mum worked at a Chinese restaurant a few days a week, and I thought this was like a never-ending yum cha. My brother decided to be a little difficult and went on a no-rice protest when he was 10. <laughs> I'm not sure if this was prepubescent rebellion or because he'd been accidentally released to a friend of his house and realised that not everybody has rice as a staple for every meal. <laughs> I'd like to think that his no rice protest was the beginning of his expansion of his palate, but it degenerated slowly into fish fingers and a microwave chicken rolls phase. Hasn't really come back from there since. <laughs> I was the good child. When we were growing up, eating out somewhere or uh, getting, getting takeout, was a break for my parents from cooking for them. And it was also a break from Chinese food for me and my brother. Sometimes food in our family, not that I knew that's what it was at the time, was a treat for everyone. As I grew up, I was slowly exposed to more cuisines. And when I was initially cooking, uh, training as a cook in Melbourne, I was introduced to Ethiopian for the first time. It was an amazing meal. But it was like my palate had no idea what to make of it. I didn't even have the words apart from, oh my God, this is delicious. When I posted to Newcastle, and there came a time where I eventually started craving Ethiopian again, I might have been disappointed that there wasn't an Ethiopian restaurant nearby to satisfy my craving. But with the power of the internet, I could look up the recipes, find the ingredients, and cook it for myself. So I was managed to, able to manage most of the cravings that I had for any kind of food that I'd had. I realised that if I hadn't tasted something before, how could I possibly crave it in the future? So I made a vow to try new things, even though, you know, I've still got a soft spot for old favourites. And because the world is full of things that I've not eaten before, I was willing to be open to more of it in the future. Think of it more like a food aggressive version of Yes Man. It's that Jim Carrey movie where Carl, the main character, challenges himself to stop saying no to things and start saying yes to everything instead. So when it comes to food, if it's on offer, has a good recommendation, or I'm pretty sure that it's not going to immediately kill me, I'm willing to give it a shot. The awesome thing about travel is trying out new food, food that you've never heard of, food that you've never seen before. I haven't travelled that much, but the only places I've been to where I had no idea what I was eating, much like when you're a toddler and you have no idea what you're eating, uh, have been in Japan, Thailand and some parts of the US. Knock wood, I've had no allergic reactions or major bouts of food poisoning, and I am pro street food all the way. Don't know what it is about food that comes from a truck or a cart, but I'm much more likely to enjoy it than if, it's, if, if I'm sitting inside a restaurant. I think it comes back to when I was a kid and if there's something with mobile food vendors around, I'm bound to enjoy it. Could be the neighborhood ice cream truck popping around or it could be the hot jam donut van in winter, but the van itself or the food itself would be an event without any other kind of show going on. Melbourne show, oh, it's just food on wheels. The thing about treating my diet as a culinary chooser and adventure is that it increases my ability to connect with people. There have been times in my life where if I've been on a diet, I shy away from social occasions involving food, which is pretty much most of them. And there have also been times when I've had the safer menu choice rather than the road less traveled. 
The thing I regret most is not anything that I have put into my mouth. It's all of those wasted opportunities to try something new and different. Life is too short for self-imposed dietary restrictions. If you are what you eat, I'm more than happy to be delicious. <laughs> now, not everyone has an iron stomach and not everyone can eat everything. Although, you can try. Anyone can go back to that cookie monster phase in their life. The eat to live version, not the live to eat version. Emotional eating has got a bad reputation in recent years. And having an emotional attachment to food can be seen as a prelude to an eating disorder. But I believe that it's more natural to be passionate about what you're eating than to be completely clinical about it. If you don't have emotions while you're eating food, you're probably eating the wrong food. If you get the same amount of pleasure from eating a bowl of Orbran as you do from a stack of pancakes, what kind of life are you really living? <laughs> the only time I'm comfortable discussing whether one food is better than another is not in terms of your dinner being a moral compass. It's more likely to, for me to say that KFC used to taste better in the 80s. That's the only instance where I'm saying something's better. I'm totally the wrong person to talk to about the obesity epidemic because after watching Super Size Me, where Morgan Spurlock eats nothing but McDonald's for 30 days straight, I felt like eating a burger. <laughs> now, I think that the label of sometimes food can be counterproductive because it makes certain foods only suitable for a treat or not at all. I believe that it's more important to teach and learn conscious eating habits instead of making any sort of food taboo. We live in a society that is incredibly judgmental and superficial and media constantly makes us want to strive towards an unrealistic physical ideal. And it reaches the point where we're made to feel good or bad about what we're eating, or worse, if we make other people feel good or bad about what they're eating. If you remember a time when putting things into your mouth wasn't an issue, unless you were eating Lego, then you might also remember a time when eating anything and everything that your folks put in front of you was the good thing to do. This reminds me of a colleague who I brought out a meal to once, and he said, oh my God, it's my favorite. And I said, What's your favourite? And he said, food! <laughs> now, you don't have to be a five-year-old or act like a five-year-old or cook exotic ingredients or even own a passport to enjoy your food. You just have to give yourself permission. So the next time you're at a restaurant, order something apart from unusual, even if you're down at the local pub. If you're cooking dinner or work lunch for the next day, try a different recipe than what you're used to. If you're going to the shops, just pick out a different spice or a sauce from the aisle. You don't even have to cook it. You just, it's already there, just give it a shot. Darwin markets are a classic example of how to have a food experiment without investing too much in something that you don't normally cook or eat. Emotional eating can be good for you if you find something that moves you. I think that you'll be missing out on a certain level of tastiness and joy in the world if you're just restricting your diet for no reason and singing songs about sometimes food. Food is a universal language and your taste buds are the only dictionary that you need. If we take a leaf from the book of the old school cookie monster, it's to increase your chances of adventure and deliciousness in the world. Opening your mind can be as simple as opening your mouth. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, eat, oh, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt once said, do one thing every day that scares you. I think that we should all try to eat one thing every day that excites us. Thank you. Thank you.